Hola a todos, ¿qué tal? Eh, voy a hablar en inglés, a menos que haya objeción. Hello all, I'm going to speak English because it's going to be easier for me and for everybody. PhD project the past four years at Imperial College London, and where we have been uh, basically trying to understand what are the effects of DMT in the brain um, as in experience. Uh, we're trying to figure out uh, what are the main effects uh, that we can associate to the phenomenology, what's happening in the body, and how can we generate bridges between these two levels of understanding uh, DMT. Um, so I'm going to present a bit about that work and I'm going to then delve into other interests related to uh, ayahuasca and psilocybin a bit more. So the main uh, perspective from which we're conducting the studies or that we're interested in understanding the experience is that we're trying to chart this very difficult unknown terrain and the challenges concerned uh, phenomenology or experience, uh, what, ex what is happening at an experiential level, uh, and trying to overcome the usual challenges when we're trying to understand consciousness, at least this subjective experiences, and connect them to uh, brain activity. Uh, we're interested in brain activity not just because we're fo solely focused in the brain, but the main interest is how can we relate brain activity to specific experiences induced by DMT to get a more complete picture. And this is all framed within the notion of uh, consciousness uh, research. So the usual model of consciousness research uh, is a two-dimensional model. It um, tries to assess how wakefulness or arousal is changed and how the contents of consciousness are changed. And within the space, the idea is that you can try to characterize consciousness. However, if the idea, the scientific endeavor of understanding consciousness is getting closer to what a specific state feels like, then this two model is not good enough for us to understand non-ordinary states of consciousness, such as near-death experiences, what happens in meditation, dreams, and psychedelics. All right, so going into DMT. DMT is a serotonergic psychedelic compound. Here you can see uh, DMT right next to serotonin. Both molecules are highly similar. Um, its use is over a thousand years old, or at least we have some evidence for that. Uh, we have recent evidence uh, from DMT use in Bolivia that recently came out, that was recently published. A very interesting finding. And as uh, I think most, or if not all of you know, it's an important part of ayahuasca. It's not the same as ayahuasca, of course, uh, but it's an important part. It's an important part of the, of the visionary elements of that experience. Uh, so in our study, we've attempted to capture uh, the phenomenology or the experience induced by DMT by the use of typical questionnaires. Uh, and in our research, for example, we've been able to reproduce the typical effects of, for example, experiencing a different reality or dimension. People have their eyes closed, but they nonetheless experience the generation of a virtual space that is completely detached from what's happening in the surroundings of the people. So it's very interesting. We have a tool in which we can generate this massive sort of simulation of sorts. And within this, we have also geometric patterns and so on. And this we can pick up in our studies. Uh, we can also, we've measured uh, this entity phenomena, uh, this feeling of sensing presences during the experience. Uh, we've also um, tried to generate parallels between the states of consciousness induced by DMT as what happens in near-death experience. And we found strong similarities between groups of people that have had gone through near-death experiences and the DMT experience itself. And this is interesting, it provides some information. However, it's not capturing the variety of possibilities that DMT can induce. So these are uh, sketches from our participants. So we asked them to reproduce in a sketch the most significant visual aspect of the experience. And in this, you can see while there are common elements, for example, their geometries, patterns and so on, uh, there's a lot of variability within the content. Um, so you can have participants with very dark experience with minimal content, or you can have many choralful experiences. You can have the experience of entities, weird spaces, and so on. So to understand that complexity, 
uh, we took an approach based on neurophenomenology or microphenomenology in which we're basically trying to let people uh, tell us their experience and through nuanced interviews, we try to get a disciplined view on what that experience was about. And through that, with the help of collaborators, we've been able to generate a story of this DMT experience. DMT usually lasts only around 10 minutes when it's uh, injected intravenously, like it, we do it in our lab. And by the use of cued recollection, we'd be able to better understand how the experience unfolds over time. So through the use of this interview, we've been able to characterize that the beginning of the experience is marked by this strong effect in the body, somatic effects, which then drop in a very strong fashion into the experience of disembodiment, as when that ha is happening, there's a strong visual element arising. Uh, geometrical patterns, this immersion into a different space. As those two effects start going down, the more metacognitive processing and the emotional processing starts to become prominent. So we have a nice mapping of the progression of effects through the use of this technique. Um, another thing that we were very interested in is what's happening in terms of brain activity. So in our first study, we run an EEG study. Basically, the EEG is that cap that you see on the participant over there. We had 13 healthy participants. We gave them DMT and placebo on separate occasions, and we tried to characterize what happens in the alpha waves, beta waves, and so on. These brain waves usually are associated to different states of consciousness. So when people have their eyes closed, alpha rhythms go up, and this is a typical effect. And this is what we see in the placebo. So this is a kind of a complicated graph, but don't worry, it's fine. So in the middle band, you see that very strong yellow current. That is the alpha pattern being activated all throughout the placebo experience. And it could be understood as an active disengagement from the environment. When people have their eyes closed, alpha goes up in a very massive way. What we see in DMT is that we have a strong uh, reduction of that alpha band, and that follows the progression of the intensity of the experience. And we can interpret these results as, as an active engagement with an environment, with this DMT space of sorts. So we took our interviews and the results from our interviews, and we related to brain activity, this neurophenomenological approach. And through this, we were able to determine that the visual imagery component, so the red line in the lower right graph there, is associated to reductions in alpha and beta and increases in lower frequencies. And this is very similar to what we see in brain activity when people are dreaming. So it's a very similar state of consciousness. People are partially disconnected from the external environment. They have their eyes closed, but nonetheless, they're experiencing worlds of experience. We saw that bodily effects are associated to these reductions in the beta waves. Beta waves in the central part of the head are usually associated to perceiving actions in others or motor activity. So a nice marker for somatic activity, an emotional and metacognitive effect to this increase, when you see this LZ, lempel sieve, is a measure of entropy or disorder. The idea is that the brain is able to experience more states than it usually can and in the same uh, analogy, uh, we're, our emotional repertoire expands following the administration of DMT. So with this, we've been able to generate a constellation of brain effects that we have associated to a constellation of effects in experience, to an unfolding in experience through the specific approach. So with that, we moved into our second study, an fMRI study that allows us to capture brain activity, but now in networks in the brain, in specific areas in the brain with a nice spatial resolution. So we gave DMT to 25 participants um, on two separate occasions. And these are some preliminary findings of that. We saw decreases in network connectivity following DMT. Uh, specifically, we saw very strong reductions in the default mode network. The default mode network is a network that is enhanced when we're not engaged in a particular activity. Um, it's been associated to this idea of thinking about oneself, self-related processing, but broadly can also be considered a sort of homeostatic function, a stability sort of marker that the system has, that the brain has, whenever it's not engaging explicitly, uh, explicitly in an activity. So we can interpret this reduction in the default mode network as this increased measure of disorder. Uh, there's a loss of a homeostatic function. The DMT is a massive perturbation to the system. 
Um, we also saw decreases in the posterior opercular network uh, related to perception of one's own body, which we can interpret possibly as this feeling of disembodiment. And finally, these reductions in connectivity in the frontoparietal network, which we can also associate with, with goal-driven behavior, this constrained form of organizing in the brain when it has to engage in a very specific task. Um, so the DMT state almost like enhancing this loss of control mechanisms. Now, what hap what's happening more in the short term, from one week to two weeks after the administration of DMT, we see significant improvement in depression scores and reductions in this personality trait of neuroticism. So we're starting to expand our view from not just the acute effects of DMT, but expanding them a couple of weeks following the experience. And in the long term, and this is a separate study, uh, which relates to what happens when a person has a single experience uh, with uh, a substance such as ayahuasca or psilocybin. And we were interested, uh, this is a part of a study, a ceremony study that you can hear more on Sunday. Uh, it's conducted by Hannes Kettner. So we developed this questionnaire with Hannes, another collaborator, uh, the metaphysical beliefs questionnaire. So tapping into the idea that a single experience with ayahuasca or psilocybin can radically change your worldview on what is the nature of reality. And what we saw is that psychedelics appear to shift uh, beliefs from a commonly materialistic perspective, this notion that reality is mainly material, into a more dualistic one. Um, the idea mainly being that there are two realms of existence. There's the mind and then there's the matter. And apparently, a single experience uh, with ayahuasca or psilocybin can enhance that. We also saw that following the administration or the, one of these experiences can increase his, uh, beliefs in other realms of existence, or not just this existence, so very connected to the idea of dualism, increases in fatalism or determinism, um, the idea determined, and no changes in free will. Uh, very importantly, we saw that the increases, the change in this uh, idea that there are other realms of existence, that increase we saw it was strongly uh, related or significantly associated uh, with increases in well-being, or reported measures of well-being. So this pos poses some interesting questions about how the context might influence the changes in these beliefs and some of the things that we're trying to do or figure out better is what is due to the substance and what is due to the context in which these experiences are happening. Is there a transmission of beliefs that are happening and that are made available through the sessions or the ceremonies themselves? So it's, a, it's an open, interesting question. So with this, what we're trying to do is understand the effects of DMT and DMT-related substances at different uh, temporal scales. So no, not only focusing on what's happening at the experiential level or what's happening in terms of brain activity during acute effects and understand the effects uh, in the longer term up until uh, the realm of deep-rooted beliefs about what is the nature of reality, uh, consciousness, and so on. So with that, uh, yeah, I'd like to acknowledge all collaborators uh, um, and our study participants. Thank you.